I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the quality of life that I'm living right now is directly attributable to the fact that I'm a Valley grad. It's where I got my foundation, it's where I got started as far as a, a college education and also with my beginning in nursing. There's no way I would be where I am. There's no way I would have the jobs I've had. There's no way I'd be the first female band director here or in the SWAT. There's no way I could have done this without Mississippi Valley. Valley means everything because what, what, I, what I tell people that I'm a, I'm a product of Mississippi Valley. This is what Mississippi Valley has produced. Valley serves a very important role that you are worthy. You are worthy of education and the best of education. It was Valley that nurtured me and prepared me to go further. It meant a lot to me because I wanted to get an education, but I wanted to be in a position to help my people, black people, black poor people like me. What you educating that boy for? To push a damn plow? No, I'm educating him to push a damn fountain pen. The Negro woman who answered that question back in 1913 was Edna White, Herbert White's mother. She and her husband were plowing the field at the time to try to earn enough money for food, clothing, and wood, and to educate her son. She instilled in him the desire to rise above the limitations placed upon Negroes back then, and with a lot of hard work and determination, that's exactly what James Herbert White did. Greetings. I'm Kylan Alfred Winfield, a 2013 graduate of the Educational Oasis of the Mississippi Delta, Mississippi Valley State University. I currently serve as a Director of Alumni Relations. We'll be taking a deep investigative dive into all things Valley. We'll start from its conception, development to where we are today and even take where we see Valley in the future. You'll hear personal recollections from trailblazers and individuals that are instrumental in making Valley what it is today. The legislation for Valley started in the legislature in April of 1946. Uh, it, it was created in the, in the Mississippi legislature and one of the main proponents of that was a wealthy Delta planner named Walter Sillers. Walter Sills was from Rosedale, Mississippi, and, and the Delta at that time had a dominant force in the Mississippi legislature because it was rural, and of course they were all white at the time, and once they got in office, they never left. If you look where Valley is now, it used to be a cotton patch. I mean, this land was farmed, but in 1950, uh, Valley was born. It started out with uh... I think it must have been something like seven faculty and 14 students or somewhere around that, around that time. From what I understand based on historically, that Valley was, it was never really intended to be in it being. It was supposed to be somewhere else. But in the meantime, it, it wound up being here at, at, in Itabina. And the legislation had, in the founding legislation, it said create a college in the Delta uh, for Negroes. The rule is it has to be in the Delta and it has the purpose it will be for vocational education and teacher education. The big thing is they didn't want to integrate the schools integrated in this area so Valley was started in order to educate teachers to be able to teach in this area because they was definitely did not want to you know didn't want the schools to be integrated. It, it was still segregation. 
very much segregation at the time. So all through the late 40s and 50s and 60s, I saw the resistance to say uh, integration. Once the, the legislature approved for Valley to be funded and uh, President, President White was hired, he came and they had just a few buildings and just like eight or 10 professors or whatever the case might be and just a few students and it kind of evolved from that. And when it was found for a while, they made an intervener until the campus got started and that's down at the Brazil Center. Now I watched them build a lot of buildings. Uh, the, the library was here, uh, English language building, industrial arts, and they didn't have a student union. They had a, a college grill, and they had a cafeteria, and it was there too. Yeah, I was six years old in 1950 when they started Valley, and I saw them building this building. And especially when they built the, uh, the administration building, the Carpenter building in 1958, when that thing was coming up, it had, it looked like we thought it was gonna be a theater or something, cause those bars, as you know, it has this rising promenade toward the front. And we were just amazed that here in the Delta, and some folks said, they building a college for colored folk. We said, no, you lying, they ain't gonna build, they ain't gonna make nothing like that for no colored folk. But they did, and this is, this is part of Valley's legacy. Dr. James Herbert White was a man of many talents, a musician, educator, scholar, and leader. He believed that friendship was the key to success. He believed in constructive relationships. Hence, he named his first house on campus Friendship Manor, and this house would become home to many presidents after him. President White had gained some prominence in Tennessee uh, by, first of all, he's president of Lane College, but he also had uh, developed schools, independent schools in Gallatin, Tennessee and around like that. So, to, And he was known as a builder. So to say, well, we got to have a college coming up out of the ground. So the little bit I know about Dr. White, I know um, he's from Gallatin, Tennessee, and that's where my father is from. So his brother, um, I don't know if they were recruited or just him being from the same hometown. They went down to Valley and they were both football players. I can speak very well on Dr. White. I knew him well and I was around him a lot because one thing about President White, I was the photographer. But I came here working in the library and doing audiovisual work. Later, I moved to the university relation, uh, the public relation office, and worked out of there. But President White believed in documenting everything. President White said that I want to build a school where black folk can get started in education, but he had a vision. So what happened was, as I said, this, it was MBC then, this was 1950. In 19, as we grew, he said, well, I, I got to have more. It's fine, we have, because they had to have a lot of teachers at the time. Uh, he said, I love teaching and I want my kids to learn vocational and all that. He said, but I also want them to have some other skills. So that's when we began to diversify. We had things like accounting, business education, criminal justice, uh, sociology, social work. Dr. White had a vision for, for the university that probably transcended a whole bunch of things. Uh, his whole idea was to, to make Valley, I guess, as we call it, an oasis here in the Delta and the kinds of things that, that they provided. He wanted to make certain that there were opportunities for African-American students to come together a quality education. And in 1976, we started graduate programs. The first graduate program was in education. I was teaching the education department at the time. And that's when we became Mississippi Valley State University. And we began to grow and President White persisted. He was a great man. He was a founder. He knew, he knew how to get in back doors. When it comes to education, he did what he had to do to uh, get things for Mississippi Valley. He was the impetus for a whole lot of, uh, really, the, the, the groundwork for putting Mississippi Valley on the map. And, and again, like I said, then it was Mississippi Vocational College 
And I think that it moved from there to Mississippi Valley State College and from there to the university status. But I think he set the tone for the whole process for Mississippi Valley in terms of ensuring that we had buildings, that we had the infrastructure that was in place to help us do what we needed to do. Oh, I think he played a major role because he was smart enough to really know how to talk to people in order to get them the funding in order to establish this campus. And with that, the campus grew uh, while he was here. And actually, the, he was the one that really worked in order to get the nursing program. If President White had not presented himself humbly and solicitous to that board, Valley wouldn't be here today. Education has played a pivotal role in the advancement of the African-American community. We've made major contributions to every human endeavor, the arts, the sciences, and technology. Well, there are a lot of things that are important, but there is no one thing that's more important than education. It can bring you from nowhere to somewhere. And people who are educated have a broad range of uh, possibilities. Even if you're educated in something that's not needed now, but the wisdom that comes with education gives you a broader perspective on life. The importance of education in the black community, I think for us as a people to get to where we're trying to get to, we've got to be educated. We can no longer sit back and, and decide that education is not important. It is the key. I was always told that it was our way out. And if you wanted to get out of the situation that you were in, whether it was poverty or uh, unemployment or whatever the case might be, the best way to do that was to get an education. Education is extremely important in the African-American community. And the reason that, well, there are a lot of reasons, but one reason, especially in the African-American community, is that we have not had the opportunities that a lot of other people, especially people, and I always say that don't look like us, and when I say that don't look like us, that's, that's not the black and brown people. And we've not, you know, we're not having those opportunities, and the system has not provided what is needed to us. That's why education is so important. Education is the key. You know, everybody may not be a uh, a doctor, or they may not major in chemistry or nursing, or any of those, but it's something out there they can major in and do. And it's going to take an education and able to, to do anything in the future because you're going to be dealing with technology. And if you can't read and follow direction, you're going to be kind of lost. Study enough to know what you don't know before you need it and get help. HBCUs are responsible for 75% of black PhDs, 46% of black business executives, 50% of black engineers, 80% of black federal judges, 85% of black doctors, 50% of black attorneys, 75% of black military officers, 40% of black dentists, 50% of black pharmacists, and 75% of black veterinarians. I don't think you can measure the impact that our university has, has had, our universities have had on society. From the beginnings, we know that uh, HBCUs was the only opportunity for African Americans uh, seeking in higher education. And we've evolved over the years, but the importance and relevance of our institutions uh, remain so, so, so important. Uh, and the numbers, the numbers don't lie. Still, even today, HBCUs are graduating disproportionately more African-Americans in very, very uh, relevant fields. There is scientific evidence that African-Americans who attend HBCUs do far better than those who attend majority schools on an undergraduate level. What grew up out of what was a cotton patch is the youngest historically black institution that has uh, sustained itself. And it's very important that Valley survives. It is critical that Valley survives because the community here are those dejected people, young and old, 
who have been disenfranchised, who have been on purpose, deliberately, poorly educated. Uh, I think that the role that HBCUs play in the life of, of its students is, is monumental. Uh, you can never understand all of the kinds of opportunities that's available to, to youngsters who come here. And I mean, most of us had never traveled, never been anywhere, never done anything. And all of a sudden here we are at the university and we have an opportunity to participate in all kinds of organizations and things and get a chance to travel. Uh, some of us were fortunate enough to travel with the, well, with the football team, the basketball team, and go to other HBCUs to see how things were actually going there. So I think HBCUs are, are needed. I think there's a they should, we should learn to give back to them once we graduate because uh, of the kinds of opportunities that they make available to students who come from diverse backgrounds or from areas where that there's not a lot of things for them to do and the kinds of ways that, that they get put into situations where they can grow and, as they say, and, and blossom to be all that they were intended to be. Since the founding of the university, the alumni of Mississippi Valley State University have been strong supporters of their alma mater. The National Alumni Association started in 1954, and as of today, I am the 22nd president. The MBSU National Alumni Association, it is the nucleus and the hub for alumni. It is the catalyst that represents you as alumni. To help in the continued growth of the university, the National Alumni Association was created in 1954. The association has been a growing force behind MBSU ever since. When you're a member of the National Alumni Association, you have a voice. Your membership gives you access to the association for us to help improve the university. Well, it's, it's important to join because numbers mean strength. Uh, numbers means money as well. So that it is important that we join together for the betterment of the university. Today, under the leadership of Charlie Tolliver as the current National Alumni Association president, this thriving organization has pledged its support of the university's national fundraising campaign and continues to support the mission and objectives of Mississippi Valley State University. This pledge was manifested yet again in 2021 with the gift of over $122,000. I don't know who heard about me at Valley, but the day that I was appointed at Valley, this guy, Will Hickman, walked out with me he said, do you know who I am? I said, you Mr. Hickman, you know, they had a list. He said, but do you know who I am? I said, I just know that you're Mr. Hickman and that you're a lawyer and that you're uh, on the board of the Institution of Higher Learning. He said, your father taught me how to fish. And then it clicked. And I turned, that, turned out, he said, listen, do you know they're trying to close your school? They just appointed you president. But this board has voted to close that school. He said, but I know someone in Washington who can help you. And that was where I got to start. So now this fellow who knew my dad and his mother would have to initial papers for me in Monticello, put me in touch. He said, now, I'm going to call up there and make an appointment for you with Mr. Whitman. And you go up and tell him what you need at school, because they're going to close it if you don't. And anyway, he called up and told him whatever he told him. Then I called as he told me to and got an appointment. And that's how the ball started rolling to save that. I had not requested an administration building, but I certainly was welcome in one. And uh, I told him that, uh, you know, the uh, administration is scattered. Uh, the president's office is here. The business office is down there. I guess uh, I had announced my retirement. And they sent somebody there to start uh, 
checking out the site and all of that to get started on the administration building. So I did not ask for that, but I don't know how the decision was made, but they invited me back up when it was dedicated. And of course, uh, it made me feel good, of course. Out of the four universities I worked at, two of them have something uh, important. Of course, Valley has the building named after me, but the top student at Dillard gets a prize called the William Sutton Prize. It's the best all around student. Well, I got it when I graduated, and it was the best in scholarship, uh, leadership, and friendship. I think it was 1979. Um, we went to homecoming, but Mama uh, was participating in the coronation. This was the first time I had seen her. And uh, she had this outfit made and she had this sequin silver hat. And when she walked into the gym, they had turned the lights out so it was a spotlight on her. And those sequins was glimmering across the gym and the people couldn't believe it. She got a standing ovation. I had goosebumps. It was at that moment that I said, I want to be Miss MVSU like my mom. I went because she went. I had something that I needed to do and I had to go to Valley to do it. Coming out of uh, J.C. George High School in Carrollton, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, uh, my uncle, uh, Frank Lacey, who, who worked at the university, uh, and Coach Cooley, they, they really convinced me to come to Valley. Uh, my, I had other offers to, uh, to ground in Jackson State, uh, Holmes Junior College, and, but I had no I, intention of going. I wanted to go to the military. I wanted to go to the Marines. And, and, uh, and my uncle just sit down talking to him, and he convinced me to just come to Valley and just take a look. You know, you never know uh, until you come to the campus and visit the campus. And, and I did that. I came for a visit, and uh, and, and had no idea that I would be going to Mississippi Valley. And, and uh, it's no doubt in my mind that uh, through his guidance, that was the best thing that could ever happen to me is, is coming to Mississippi Valley and, and knowing that I got a good education, have a great foundation that's lead to me where I am today. If you look out across, by where the water tank is, you look straight across there, that's an area out there called Lake Henry. I brought one of my props. <laughs> This is a throwback cap that I brought from the studio, and I prize this cap because when I started Valley, this is what it was called, MVC, Mississippi Vocational College. I had an a instructor in high school. I graduated from Broad Street High School in Greenwood. Uh, his name was Robert Warren. Robert Warren was a Valley State grad and a biology major. And uh, I should never forget, and I owe, I guess, all that that I am right now probably to him because he came to my house one morning and got me up out of the bed and told me he was taking me to Valley so he could get me in school. And uh, though I had planned to go to the military, uh, but he said, no, we, we're going to take you to Mississippi Valley. And I guess I'm a biology major because he was a biology major. My goal is always to do nursing. And I always wanted to go to nursing school and become a nurse. And see, and I came here in 1965 and the way I got here in 1965, the dean of students that was here had been dean of students where I had gone to high school and junior college. When I think about with Dean Johnson, bless his soul, he's looking down now, but you know, I'm sure he'd be proud that not only me, but there are a lot of others that he did the same thing that helped to make a difference. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, born and raised my entire life. Um, I graduated from Fairleigh High School in Memphis. I came here as a freshman. I graduated, uh, I graduated here. I did, my, I did all my time here as an undergrad. Graduated in 95. I was under uh, the great Leonard Trammell. I met Mr. Trammell, I think I must have been about six. They were um, 
the homecoming parade actually used to be in Greenwood. And so the parade was going down the street in Greenwood and I was so excited. And he saw this little girl, you know, standing bug-eyed, you know, enjoying the band and just for him to shake my hand, you know, acknowledge me standing there. It was amazing. I was most proud. I always remember in 1965, I was, uh, that was my junior year in, in Valley. And uh, the band got an invitation to go to the uh, Rose Bowl Parade in Pasadena, California. And the, the narrator sort of said, all the way from, it, it to be, it, they couldn't trouble stand, couldn't say it to me. They said, all the way from Mississippi, the uh, Mississippi Vocational College Band. And we came, walk down the street. Mr. Brussel Boone, legendary Boone, band director, was the band director then, and Mr. Leonard Tremell, who was the next band director, was a student in the band. When I came here, Mr. Russell Boone, the director of band, and the band was, they put a lot of emphasis on the band. And I mean, they played good music. I used to travel with the band. Everywhere they went, I went. They went to the Tournament of Roses twice, I believe. I went both times. Tremel, who was uh, the band director for he was I was here when he uh, came uh, as a student. Mama would take us to homecoming, and it was the parade. And I loved the core style to this day. I loved it. I was in the band all four years. Well, I tell you, back in the day, man, when we, when we, when we played and we we stepped out on that field and and we had uh, just about a sellout crowd every time we played and and uh, and and they used to come in that stadium and they playing that 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 fight song. It just gives me chills, man. And and I know what the impact that it does when you when you as a player and you see that band and you see that band come on the field and you know that they singing that song and getting getting everybody pumped into it and. And, it's, and I've been at Mississippi Valley for a long time. I've been around here for over 20 some years and I still get the chills when I hear that band, when they come into the stadium and, and uh, they play so good. I mean, I have to take my head out to the directors uh, over there to really getting everybody ready, getting everybody pumped. And uh, I, I don't think Valley would be the same if we didn't have the Mean Green Machine. I went on to teach high school. I taught high school for 10 years and decided I wanted to be a college band director. And um, so I needed to go back to school for that. I went back to school, uh, got my grad degrees, and I started teaching at Cahoma Community College. And I left community, Cahoma Community College. Uh, Mr. Milton gave me a phone call, said an opening was coming up. Was I interested? And absolutely, you know, because I want to be a college band director. So I, can, I ended up here. Um, I got here in 17, fall 17, and I've been here ever since. It's amazing to me that you would think that an educational institution would, would, would primarily be interested a lot in, 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 in education, but I'm here to tell you that athletics plays a major role in this whole process. And Mama, you snagged you a football player. Yeah, that's what I married. Uh, a football player. So just before I got there, um, Willie Totten and Jerry Rice were really big. My sister went to school with them. Well, I tell you, well, it, was, it was another uh, a big, a very uh, serious moment in my life. I uh, started out uh, with a program that was not winning when I first got to Mississippi Valley, and, and we just completely turned it around. I mean, I, I take my hat off to Coach Cooley, who, who's a very firm, uh, very uh, demanding person, uh, and, 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 and he has made me who I am today. I, I stand on his shoulders. Uh, because he, he laid the foundation. When Cooley came in 81, 
we had some big wins. We, we beat Southern University in the last three minutes of the ball game, but threw 80 yard touchdown pass and broke Southern's back. Southern didn't even want to go home. We beat, uh, but the big thing was the streak. And what I call the streak, uh, they, they, it was, it was Jackson State beating Valley. I think the last time Jackson Valley had beaten Jackson State was in 1955 under Coach McPherson, the second year that Valley played football. From then up to 1984, we had not beaten Jackson State. We went into Jackson in Memorial Stadium in 84. We had played two games at the time. We were scoring a point a minute, Willie Totten, Jerry Rice. Now, those names always come up because they're in the stadium, but we had Carl Byron was a fullback. Uh, uh, we had uh, the offensive line was called a ton of fun. We went up 14 to nothing on Jackson State. Jerry Rice caught the first two touchdowns. Uh, Jackson State rallied back. They put in a, a very hard rush of Blitzkrieg, and they fumbled us two a couple of times. They got 14-14. Okay, but we scored two more touchdowns, and we went up 28-14 at halftime. They said, uh, okay, but we got you. We came by the second half. The first play of the second half, uh, Jerry Rice scored about 30 yards out, tied and threw the ball, and Jerry went in the end zone on three wheels, one hand and two legs. I was sitting in the stadium, and I couldn't see because it was dark down in that corner. All we know, I heard the PA man say, touchdown, and we won, Jack beat Jack State 49 to 32 to break the streak. It's just amazing, uh, just going back to Coach Cooley, he pulled all of us together. Uh, and he pulled a brotherhood together that we, we are bonded for the rest of our lives. And, and uh, Jerry and I, we, we got to be even closer when we became fraternity brothers, and, and, and we're still close to this day. And, and, uh, and, and I think all that due to Coach Cooley, uh, his, his leadership and his guidance. Athletics brings uh, students to the, to the university. The more athletes that we turn out that might go play professional ball or come out to be coaches and things. And what that does is it gives an opportunity for those coaches to send some of their better players back to the university as well, which is again is a, is a good thing because all around this Delta, you can find a whole bunch of, of coaches, uh, referees and the like that uh, matriculated here in Mississippi Valley and they are part of this, this whole process and, and they still support the university. Uh, it's no doubt that uh, the athletics has a has a a great impact on the university, and not only in terms of of the money value that they, it can bring, but but recruiting students. I mean, you 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 talk about the athletes that come, and everybody want to be a part of uh, of what's going on, and and as an athlete, and we have been very successful. Uh, at Mississippi Valley in, in all sports. You know, we, we won here and it just goes back to the excitement. And, and you take that away from, from any university, I think you will see a big letdown in terms of enrollment, in terms of enthusiasm on the campus because athletics bring that to you. Where is Mississippi Valley State going? What do we see our university at in the next five to 10 years? I see nothing but positive growth. I see us being successful in providing that quality education that we know our students deserve. Uh, again, transforming lives. I say all the time, lifelong learning is, is a passion. We should always be in a position to learn and to grow. And it's not just about what you learn in that textbook. It's about what you learn in life. And so I see our university continue to, to produce uh, top quality graduates uh, in all fields. I see us being very successful as we look to build and grow our institution and offer more academic opportunities uh, and, the, and the like. I really think that our future is bright uh, and I see a lot of hope uh, and a lot of opportunity for our university going forward. And that's why I'm so passionate about being here and so passionate about asking us all to be a part of this, to be a part of the success, to be a part of the challenges and working through those challenges, but recognizing at the end of the day, this unity, this university is so important, so important for our students, so important for our community, so important for our state and so important for our nation. 
So I really, when we talk about us being in motion, it's more than just those words. For me, it's a passion. It means we're moving in the right direction. We're being productive, we're being strategic, and we're assuring that our university does not just sustain itself, but that we thrive and continue, continue to do great things. Since the passing of our founding president and first lady, the MVSU family lays reefs in observance of their contributions to our beloved MVSU. In normal circumstances, this would usually be a resplendent occasion, heavily attended by students, faculty, staff, and alumni. Due to the global pandemic caused by the novel coronavirus, better known as COVID-19, we were unable to host this event publicly. That's got shall get them that's not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it still is news. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. Oh, oh. that's got his own. Yes, the strong gets more while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets don't ever make the grave. Mama may have, Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own.